Wednesday night. You know, again, often, you know, we read the book of uh, Ruth. We don't make the connection between the book of Ruth and the book of Judges, you know, just especially when you think about the book of Judges. And, you know, it says that every man did what was right in his own eyes. And as we studied this book, we saw this cycle, you know, of sin. The, the people would be in harmony with God. They would wander away from God. And then next thing you know, they're in they're in sin and they're in bondage and then ultimately you know, they cry out to God and God would send a judge or a redeemer. And then we have this book, you know, again, and if you were here with us last week, that's, it's almost like a terrible way, you know, to end, you know, a book. It just wasn't a pretty picture. You know, we, we see that, you know, first the, the religious, you know, anarchy that took place in Israel and then obviously the moral anarchy that's right on the heels of it. And that's true with any people, uh, true with any people. When, once you lose your relationship with God, all bets are off. And we've, we've studied the book of Romans and we see that. You know, the Bible says that when we're no longer grateful, we're no longer thankful, it says that God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And they just started to do, you know, I mean, terrible things. And we're seeing that in our world. You know, it started, you know, back in the 50s and the 60s. We started taking the Bible out of school and uh, we started taking prayer, you know, out of school. Then we started taking, you know, the Ten Commandments out of, you know, courtrooms and public buildings and things that people, you know, in churches went, Ah, you know, it's not that big a deal because we can do that in church. But we realized that we lost a lot of our influence then in the world. We, we might say that we caved in. Uh, there's an argument before the Supreme Court right now on gay marriage. And again, this isn't a, uh, to go into a study on gay marriage or, you know, gay marriage is just as much a sin as any other sin that exists. But it's in the, it's in the, in the limelight today. And it's sad that, that Christians have backed off of the fact that what the Bible says, if we just came back to the Constitution and with regard to what our Creator has said, because so much of our Constitution is woven into what our Creator has ordained. And so if we go back and we, you know, this isn't a, a civil issue here. This is a moral uh, and it's a spiritual issue. But to try to make it more palatable, you know, we start changing the wording and the next thing you know, it just becomes a legal argument. Well, when you make it a legal argument in a democracy, guess Guess what? Just like we find in the book of Judges. Every man does what's right in his own eyes because then it's just democracy in the sense of 51 to 49, you might say. And again, then it has nothing to do with what's moral or you know what is right before the Lord. It's just what the people want at that, that point. And again, we're not truly, again, not to get into this, but I am somewhat uh, heading down a rabbit trail here. When you think about it, we are we are a republic. You know, again, we're not a pure democracy. This isn't just a 50-50, a you know, you just you vote. We have a constitution that, that frames what our democracy is. So if someone says, well, you know, hey, we want, you know, we want this, and you go, well, the framework of our constitution doesn't allow it, we go back to what the constitution says. And again, so then it, it prevents just the popular vote from taking over. But again, as a, as a country, we've moved away from really the true constitution of what it is to be a believer, and that is the Word of God. And you know, we study the Beatitudes, and you might say that's the constitution of the kingdom of Christ. And so these are the things that, you know, we would adhere to. And yet, you know, when you look at this, the, the book of Judges, you know, it's really no different than the time uh, in, that we live in today, like we were discussing, you know, in weeks past. And so, uh, it, like I said, it ended terribly, but then it came to this place now where we get to study, there's a glimmer of hope, and there always is a glimmer of hope, no matter how dark it is. And I think that's one of the things I wanted to begin tonight, you know, if you're here and you're going through a difficult thing, and you, you can relate to the book of Judges, maybe you go, Pastor Mike, I understood that book so much because I just go through that cycle of sin. Man, I, I'm good with God for a little bit. And trust me, this isn't what he wants. He's not in, he doesn't want us to live in this cycle. His word identifies it, but it's not his desire. What he wants, and Jesus declared, was he wants us to abide with him. Amen? I mean, if you're abiding in Christ, you know, we, we talk about this almost every Thursday night at Men's Bible Study. We go, guys, we could be anywhere on a Thursday night. But we're here in the cafe, you know, at Calvary Chapel. I mean, you think about it, and we go, what did you used to do on a Thursday night? And guys, you know, you go, 
you go, Pastor Mike, the Bible says not even to make mention of those things, you know, and you go, okay, I get that, and you go, but isn't that awesome? You go, we're abiding in Christ, and so we're here, and I go, even if you went and told your friends, and they found out that you, they go, really, they're, they're in a Bible study on a Thursday night? And you go, yeah, because when you're abiding in Christ, you're not in sin. I go, now, what's going to happen at 9 o'clock when you guys leave here? I, I don't know, but I knew from 6.30 to 9, we were okay, right? Now everybody starts to understand why did the early church meet daily from house to house? You go, they didn't have jobs. <laughs> no, they, they worked. <laughs> they knew that, man, to stay on the straight and narrow, you can't make it on your own because you will eventually wander. You will eventually do what the book of Judges talks about. All of a sudden, you'll start to interpret Scripture for yourself. You'll start to say, well, God didn't really, you'll start to mock the enemy and not even know it. You'll start going, God didn't say that. God didn't mean that. And if the Holy Spirit could quicken that in your heart, he'd say, hey, guess who else said that? Man, that goes right back to the garden experience, right? Man, you don't want to be on the same side as the devil. And so what we need to do is come back to the place that we recognize his kingship and his lordship in our life. And yet when I look at our country, you know, today, and especially, you know, this last couple days, I mean, what are people doing? I mean, I'm watching the news, and it's not even in disbelief anymore because it's almost like if you, we've all seen it, right? It's almost like it's, it's, it's not even new news anymore. That's the scary part. That's the thing about we get to the place where uh, we are so desensitized to everything in this world. So we're, we're flipping the channels, and there's rioting going on, right, in, in Baltimore. And we go, oh, yeah, there was, hey, two weeks ago it was in New York, and it was in Ferguson before that. Okay, hey, uh, what's on tonight? You know, oh, The Voice. Okay, hey, let's watch The Voice, you know. And we don't even, and people are going, and I mean, I've had conversations with people. I go, uh, hey, are you, did you hear what's happening in Baltimore? And they go, oh, yeah, the Oriole game. Man, that was weird, wasn't it? I mean, that they, they didn't even play in front of fans. They, they had them just like play, you know, and they, and they were showing stuff. They said it was so cool. They said uh, the guy would get a, a hit, do a home run, and he would take his hat off and run around the stadium, and there's nobody in the stands. But they go, they were just going through the motions, pretending they were just trying to make fun of a bad thing. They were just, their, their pitcher would do good, and he'd take his hat off, and he'd salute the stands, and there's not anybody in the stands. And they're going, oh, yeah, I knew all about that. And you go, but, yeah, but did you understand what took place? And they go, no, I didn't really. Well, that's the same thing that was happening with many of the people who were rioting. They didn't know, you know, this person who was killed. They just went with what? The masses. They just all of a sudden go, hey, everybody's looting, everybody. And then you go, and then ultimately what were they doing? And this is the, this is... Because the Bible says sin is darkness, right? Sin is blindness, right? When we're sinning, we're blind. We, we, we're, not, we're not getting it. They were destroying their own city. They were mad at the police, so they destroyed their own city. I mean, wouldn't you think logically, if you were going to at least be mad, you'd go to somebody else's city? I mean, if you're going to keep it in a logical format, but to go destroy your own city. I mean, that's ludicrous. That, that's darkness and then what was the curfew the curfew is you know the bible says men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds being evil right they they long for darkness so they can come out then in the daytime it's just you know kind of back to normal it's really weird and all of a sudden in another city as soon as it gets dark and you go and that was the book of judges and you go well wait a second that's a, that's the united states of america today tonight and then the sad reality is you go, not for you, thank God, because you're here on a Wednesday night, you're seeking the Lord. But there's a whole Christian community that is doing nothing. They're not praying. They have no concern because they're just going, hey, Baltimore, you know, if I look at the globe, they're like, like 3,000 miles away, right? You know, 3,500 miles. It, it's not a, it has nothing to do with us, right? But man, what if it happened here? What would happen? Well, we all, if you were around, you know, if you were walking with the Lord on 9-11, you should have seen this place. It was standing room only the day after 9-11. And people thought, what, Jesus was coming, and guess what? They wanted to be right. <laughs> they were like, and then we'd watch it, you know, two weeks, you know, three weeks, and it took less than a month, and it was, it was back to what? Normal, you know? And so this is the world in which we live in today. 
You know, Jesus warned us that this would happen, though. I, I was, as soon as it, I was watching that, you know, yesterday, it just came to my mind, you know, Mark 13, 8, Jesus said this, for nation will rise against nation. So we get that nation, that's like United States against Canada, or United States against Mexico, or the United States against Iran, you know, whatever it might be. And then it says kingdom against kingdom. And you know what kingdom is? Kingdom is city against city. So it's no longer, we go, oh, we're not, who are we really fighting with? Nobody outside. You go, where's the fighting happening in America? Kingdom against kingdom. And Jesus said, there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines and troubles. This will be the beginning of sorrows, birth pangs. And people will say, oh, Pastor Mike, this has been going on, you know, uh, since the beginning of time. And you go, it has. It has to a certain degree. But what we see what Jesus is talking about now and what we're seeing scientifically proven is the what? The fervency at which it's occurring. See, that's why the numbness is happening because everybody's just seeing it, right? It's just, it's just almost a day-to-day -day occurrence. And yet, we're not to hang our heads and we shouldn't lose heart. We should do, and it's what I asked you to do tonight. Let's fulfill the Word of God. 1 Timothy 2.8 says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere. That's men, women, everybody. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Paul would write in Romans 12.1 and 2, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And here's the key, you know, what's taking place in the world today. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I was at the gym and there was the interview with Bruce Jenner. He, he came out and he said that he's basically a, a, a woman living in a man's body. So now it's about not any longer homosexuality, it's, it's transgender. And it was on a Friday night when they uh, he did an interview with Diane Sawyer and it was, they said the viewing audience was like, 15 million. It was just one of the largest viewing audiences beyond a sporting event. So, and, and I'm watching these these people at the gym when it came on, and it was like it, it was it almost reminded me of the O.J. Simpson uh, slow speed chase on the 405. If you remember that, how people just stood there. Well, people at the gym, even though this had come out, you can tell people are they're dumbfounded. I'm not talking about just Christians. The world is looking at this, and they were just standing. It was like everything stopped in the gym. And I was, I was on this machine, and, and I was looking at the people, and all of a sudden everybody was looking in the same direction. So I was looking to see who, who were they looking at. You know, it was like, did some, like, Joe Atlas guy walk in, or, you know, and, and they're looking it up, and I, there's the television monitor, and it was the interview. And they were just watching. It was like, and you could see people, and they'd look at each other, and they're just going, they don't get it. But I hope tonight we get it because this is what happens when you move away from the Word of God, when you move away from the Spirit of God, and you begin to give your own definitions of what right and wrong are and what good and evil are. That's what's happening in the world today because what's taking place? Every man is doing what's right in his own eyes. And so the book of Judges ended that way and, we're, and we saw just devastation. And then all of a sudden you go, wait a second, is it over? Is it over? And you go, no, because what we fail to realize, there's a connection between the book of Judges and the book of Ruth. They both take place during the same period of time. So there's always, you might say, a remnant. There's always one. And maybe tonight, like I said, you might be the one. You might be, you know, I know a lot of your stories, and I know for some of you tonight, we think about, you know, you're going through a difficult thing, whether you're, you're, separated from your spouse or you're just in a, in a lousy you know, marriage relationship for whatever the reason is. But the Bible says that the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the believing husband. All it takes is one. And the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the believing wife. That your kids are still holy. They're still blessed. What God's saying is that there's still a unit. There's still unity within that family. He recognizes it because of your faithfulness. Or maybe, like I said, you're just going through a terrible, terrible trial in your life right now, and you feel like, gosh, I'm, I'm all alone. You're not alone. The difficulty that we have, and we'll throw this out right now, we know in this story, because we have the luxury of knowing the history, right? Ruth didn't know the future, did she? 
Naomi didn't know the future. And as we read through this, I mean, you got to remember these are real people. This isn't just this isn't a Disney story here. You know, so we tend to do that with the Bible. These were real people going through real hurts and pains. And we have this failure in life is to only look at the moment and to lose sight of eternity. But everything God does is not about the moment. Do you recognize that? It's about eternity. And when you start to understand God's heart, there's always hope. Because in this story, though we don't read it in the story, we know it because of history. Ruth is going to be redeemed. You know, two great words from this book are the word redeem and relative. Kinsman redeemer. Redemption. Ruth will be redeemed. She loses her husband, we're going to read, and her sons. But God in his grace and his mercy, she will remarry. I mean, you got to think in the moment that she was going through what she was going through, because we have Naomi's testimony that we'll read, and what happens. And I love the, the honesty of the Word of God. God doesn't gloss over it. That I mean, she didn't have a strong faith, Naomi. She lived up to her name. Her name means bitter, Mara. And in this, you look at Ruth, though. Ruth became what? The great-grandmother to the greatest king besides Jesus that Israel has ever known, King David. Now, if you could have told her that, at the beginning of her struggle, do you think that would have blessed her? Do you think, oh yeah, that would have, I mean, that would have said, okay, because don't all of us have, you know, why questions? You know, why? Why me? Why this? Why that? And if God just said, hey, if you just knew right now, it isn't about right now, because that's our problem. We look at right now and go, it's about right now. And you go, no, 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 no. Maybe what is happening in your life and in my life has to do with two generations from now. So you don't have the ability to see that, nor do I. But guess what? God does. And I hope is, again, for those of you that are, that are struggling, especially that are hurting tonight because of your current circumstance, that you realize God's bigger than your circumstance, that he's bigger than your situation, that he's actually doing something that can impact generations from generation to generation because then the ultimate end of Ruth's endeavor was she became part of the seed if she was part of the seed of the line of David then she also because Jesus himself was what of the seed of David then she's in the line of the Messiah to think about that that her life played a role in the ultimate end of our Savior being born into this world. And you go, wow. And yet, do you think she saw any of that? No. See, it takes us to Hebrews chapter 11, doesn't it? It's an amazing thing that chapter 11 is the hall of faith, the Bible says. And it says that everyone died without receiving the promise. They all died without getting what they were looking for. But it says, but they saw it afar off. They saw it. And they didn't lose hope. And God was pleased to be called their God. And I say that to you tonight because, again, if you're struggling, to say, you know what? Keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on what Jesus is doing. If you look at your circumstance, it'll mess you up each and every time. You'll lose hope. You'll lose heart. You'll end up like many in the streets of Baltimore. You'll just end up doing what's right in your own eyes. If there is no Jesus and there is no resurrection from the dead, then as the Paul the Apostle said, then eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you surely die. And many people, and we're seeing that, even people of faith. See, Naomi was a person of faith here. And so when you think about the difference that you can make, just know you can make a huge difference. You know, I go back and I think about, you know, when, when uh, God 
does it work through a remnant, through a one? You know, the very first one, we, we probably remember this, right? In the, in the book of Genesis, in the story of Noah, all the world was going to be judged. But how many people? It came down to not the masses, but eight people. Eight people. That's, that's a small number, right? Do you remember Elijah? You remember the story of Elijah there in 1 Kings? And he's, he's in a battle, you know, with Jezebel, right? And he's scared to death. And then ultimately he ends up in a, in a fight, in this battle against the, the prophets of, of Baal. And they bring their prophets, and you remember this. And, and, and Elijah's praying all the time, you know, 450 prophets of, of, of Baal are going to come down and, and uh, stand against him. And, and he's praying to God. And do you remember what he prays? He'd pray every time and he'd say, Lord, there's none left but what? But me. See, Elijah, who was a man of God, a man of faith, he got to the point looking around that he's going, you know, and that wasn't a presumptuous thing or a prideful thing. He's just looking around because there's nobody left but me. And the Lord, again, in a beautiful picture, and he basically then says to him, he says, hey, Elijah, he said, nah, you might think that, and it might look that way today, but guess what? I've got 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. They're there. And God always has a remnant. That's the most important thing. And Ruth and Boaz, they represent that, that, that remnant. There's so many pictures that we can see Boaz being a type of Christ and you and I being like Ruth and him being our redeemer and, and uh, you and I as the bride of Christ. And so, so much, you know, for us to be able to glean from this. And like I said, I, I hope as we go through this, you know, that it teaches us. And if there's one thing that I, I again, I, I hope you, you get this. And if you're a note taker, I would really encourage you to write this down and to meditate on it or at least lock it in your mind. Because the book of Ruth will teach us that simple obedience to the Lord today. Okay, simple obedience to the Lord today may be setting the stage for the work of God in future generations. So we, we talk a lot about legacy in this church, and for good reason. And yet, when you think about your own life and your own legacy, I mean, that's a powerful thing to know that, again, one life, one life live for Christ can change the world. Just as Jesus, one life, lived for the Father, changed the world, for God to love the world. That he gave his one, his only. When it says only begotten, he was one of a kind. There's nothing, no one else like him. It came down to one. And with one, God prevailed. And I hope that that can encourage you tonight because, like I said, as you walk through this, I mean, we live in, in a, the midst of tremendous ungodly conditions in this world. And it's easy to fall prey. It's easy to grow tired and weary. And, you know, when are we most susceptible to sin and the attacks of the devil? When we're, when we're weak, right? When we're tired. Jesus was, went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And most people think, oh, he went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil like it was an option, like he could have lost or... No, he went into the wilderness to defeat the devil, to demonstrate that the devil had nothing on him. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. And so the devil comes and he says, Jesus, if, you know, if you're the Son of God, then turn you know, these stones to bread. And Jesus is hungry. He's going, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so as you look through this, I mean, you have the word of God. We have the opportunity. And I pray that his word becomes that comfort to you more than anything else. The world, you know, hits a bottle. It hits drugs, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you might say. But, man, we have the word of God. Jesus said it, 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 it's living water that satisfies at the deepest place of our soul. It is bread that's come down from heaven. So read this with me, if you would. It says... Uh, Again, now it came to pass in verse 1 there, it says, In the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. So it tells us right away, which people go, well, how do you know this is the time of the judges? 
It doesn't take a, a rocket scientist. You don't have to have a lot of commentary either, right? It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And like I said, you know, there's a famine. That's, that's the obvious here. Why was there a famine? I, I don't know. I don't know if it was the judgment of God. I, I believe that, you know, as God said, he said if they would walk with him, that he would bless the land. But if they were disobedient and they turned to other gods, what did he say? He would stop the rain from coming, so famine would come to the land. So I, I have to believe part of it is just that. Uh, but yet the other side of it is I, I know that because of the fall of man, there's famines, you know, that it's not necessarily the judgment of God. Maybe it's God doing something that is for future generations. Maybe he's ultimately going to alter the world system somehow, some way for the glory of God. So the key is, is to discern the word of God, is to be in the word of God and not jump to conclusions every time, you know, something happens. And again, walking by sight instead of by faith. And, you know, when you think of the, the names here, and these are so important in this book, Bethlehem means house of bread. And this was a land just like it is today. Man, it is, it is a rich, rich soil. If you go to the grocery store and you see, you know, Joppa oranges, you know, they bring them from all the way from Israel and they ship them all around the world. Some of the most fertile, just like California, some of the most fertile ground in the world. I mean, God has, I mean, especially blessed this particular land. It's great for agriculture and again but then you think about the other side of it is you know why would God judge the children of Israel the question that begs to be asked is why would he judge the children of Israel but he wouldn't judge the children of Moab because Moab was what you know it was 50 miles away basically but it was a pagan city right they were they had you know uh, Shemes or Shemes was the the God kind of like Baal uh, that they worshiped there so they were they worshiped uh, you know they were pagans, they worshiped false gods, and yet God's not judging them. And you go, well, wouldn't he have judged them just as much as he would have judged? That becomes the, the natural mind argument. And you go, well, but what does his word say? He says, judgment begins where? With the house of God. Yeah, First Peter 4.17 reminds us, it says, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So God always judges his people first. Now you think, why would he have judged the nation of Israel before he would have judged Moab? And you go, because they had what? The law of Moses. They had the prophets. They had every ability to hear the voice of God, and they were rejecting it. So obviously it would start with them. And again, it goes on, it says, And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Shilion, uh, Aphrodites of Bethlehem, Judah. And it says, And they went to the country of Moab, and they remained there. You know, and you got to love how people got their names. I wish we could go around tonight, because some of you got named, and when you learn how your parents came to that, that conclusion of that name, it's actually kind of funny. You know, like, but you look at, you know, here, I mean, you think about, it's not really funny, but I guess we'll, we'll, we'll look at it and you can see this. But you think back to beyond uh, the boys mentioned here, uh, you remember, uh, well, Isaac and Rebecca, right? I guess we'll go back that far. They've got two sons, right? Esau and Jacob. So when Esau, he was born, what did, what did they say? When he came out, it says he was what? He was hairy, right? So they just basically on the characteristics when they were born into the world, that's kind of after the fact. They didn't, like a lot of people today, they name their children before they're born, right? But really in biblical times and still even today in, in many Middle Eastern countries, they wait till the child's born. And then whatever the times maybe that they live in, that's a reflection of that child or some characteristic about the child. I mean, thank God you didn't come out with like a humongous nose or big ears or something. They go, here's, you know, Dumbo, you know, and then the whole rest of your life, you know, you, hey, Dumbo, how'd you get that name? You go, well, you know, <laughs> not hard, uh, you know, and you have to live with that. But, uh, you know, then you think about... You know, like I said, not just that Esau means Harry, but then his brother Jacob, when he was born, what happened? When he was born, it says he grabbed his heel, right? And his name became what, you know, his, his dad's brilliant, you know? What does he say? What's his name? Heel catcher, right? So what's your heel catcher? Heel catcher and Harry. You got a Harry heel catcher, you know, for, you know, for a son. But Elimelech's name, it means my God is king. Naomi means pleasant one. 
And when you think about this, because she gets to a place where she changes her name because of the fact that she's so embittered by her losses here. But their son's names, Malon means sickly. He was the husband of Ruth, and we see that in chapter 4. Uh, Chilion means pining or wasting away. You know, when someone's just wasting away, man, they're just, you know. And he was married to or Orpah, not, not, not to be confused with Oprah, okay? Uh, no, no connection there. But to, obviously from their birth, they weren't very healthy, in which then we can see that they didn't live very long lives either, I mean, which probably led to their, their downfall. You know, think of Judah, again, we're reminded, we walk through this, Judah means praise. So you kind of look at these names here, and they really take on uh, some significance. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. I mean, you think about this in, in the time in which they lived. I mean, for her husband to die. I mean, women, for the most part, you know, were possessions. They didn't really have many rights, and so they were completely dependent upon their husband. So this is a, a devastating loss, but luckily she's got two sons. Well, it doesn't sound like they're very healthy, so unfortunately now this is a single mom having to take care of basically two sickly kids. And again, when you look upon this, I mean, you, this, you look at the storyline here and you go, man, this is, not, this is not good. It says, now they took wives, so they'd moved to Moab, right? So now the boys have taken wives there of the, woman, of the women of Moab, and the name of one of them was Orpah, and the other name was Ruth, and they dwelt there about 10 years. And interesting, you know, from a biblical perspective, the Moabites, they weren't forbidden by law for, for a a Jewish man to marry a Moabite. There was certain nations that God had instructed, you will not marry the Canaanites, the Amalekites, you know, the, all the I, 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 that are all listed throughout Scripture here. But the Moabites weren't among those names. And so they could marry them. But we remember in Deuteronomy chapter 23, because of this, and I'll read this to you, they were to, if you married a Moabite woman, you were, in a sense, to be excommunicated, not taken into fellowship, to the 10th generation here. So if you loved a Moabite woman, I mean, you had to realize there was a price that you were going to pay, because you were going to, in a sense, be disfellowshipped by entering into a marriage with her. Deuteronomy 23, 3 and 4 puts it like this. It says, uh, the Lord talking about this particular relationship, it says, an Amorite or a Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from uh, Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. And so God, he makes it really clear. So the Moabites, they're not really your friends. So to marry a Moabite, you know, wasn't a, wasn't a good thing. And yet God didn't forbade it here. And obviously we see this then in the life of Ruth. We're going to see with her and Boaz. What? The same thing with regard to me and you. We are brought into relationship with God by the law or by grace. And so it's going to be a, a beautiful picture of God's grace. But we do know this then about Ruth. She had to be a worshiper of Jehovah though. So we know that she has a love for God. Uh, and actually I'm going to, I'll give you guys a little bit of a kind of a clue. I'm actually doing my Mother's Day message this year based on the context really of, of this. So I'll tell you tonight and that way you, you can just skip it. You don't have to come on Mother's Day. So, because I love you guys and I want you to be able to, but because there, there's such a, a beautiful picture here. I think that you can bring this out uh, for moms in particular. Um, Orpa, think about her name here. What does it mean? It means back of the neck. Back of the neck. Okay, what can that mean? Now Israel was called a what? Stiff neck people, okay? And you go, is that what it was talking about? I don't know. Maybe she had a beautiful back of her neck. Maybe that was, or maybe she had a stiff neck, but she had a beautiful stiff neck. I mean, you could still be a stiff neck woman and be beautiful, right? It's just, I, I will just leave that right there. I'm not going to go any further with it. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't know what the implication, you know, of that. I'm, I'm hoping that she just had a beautiful neck and so that became her neck. Like, hey, there's a beautiful neck going, wow, oh my gosh, she, she's got a beautiful neck. Just hang a necklace on that thing, you know. It says, then both Malon and Chilion also died. Man, you talk about going from bad to worse. It says, so the women 
survived her two, the woman survived her two sons and her husband. And again, now look at it. I mean, you think about for Naomi, she's got nobody. She's got no security blanket at all. Husband's gone, sons are gone. I mean, we live in a, a male-dominated culture, and you think about it, that you think that now, I mean, way, way more in her time. And she's what? Older. She's in her older age. I mean, you've got to think of the fear that has to be gripping her. It says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. So word gets back that, guess what? They, there's been rain in Bethlehem. It'll be just like when it starts to rain here in California. Guess what's going to happen? Man, the crops are going to come back. The fish are going to come back. You know, everything that needs water. Wells are going to, you know, rise again. I mean, all these reservoirs, all these things. I and mean, people will do what? They'll come back. There'll be lakes again where you can go and recreate and all these things that, you know, they're gone. So she hears word and that the, many of the crops are, are back. And with crops come what? There's bread. And so, again, she hears this and says, Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So they start on this 50-mile trek, you know, back to Judah, back to Bethlehem. And says, And Naomi said to her, her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. So she's in her misery. She's still caring about, you know, her daughters-in-law. She's like, listen, you know, this is, you know, there's still hope for you is what she's trying to communicate to them. And then, Again, you can read this, and she says, And the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. She, she's wanting them to stay and to find husbands again and get remarried. It says, Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices, and they wept. I mean, can you picture that for a moment? The hurt that she's going through? I mean, this is what death does. It's destructive. It, it brings nothing but pain, because it's a reminder of loss and I've shared this oftentimes you know when I'll do a funeral is that it's okay if you struggle with death uh, we were not created for death we were created for life death was a byproduct of sin and to try to ever get good with it is really to go against every fabric of your being because it's our last enemy the Bible says it makes really no sense to us when you you logically try to walk through things and 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 again here it brings them to a place where they just weep they probably cried until they couldn't cry anymore it was just that's how much pain there was it says and they said to her surely we will return with you to your people but Naomi said turn back my daughters why will you go with me are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands because remember under Jewish law that Jesus tells this story, you know, about, you know, if a man dies and he's, he's not bore any children into this world, that uh, his brother then would marry his wife and for posterity of his name. And then if he died, because you know, they were trying to say, well, you know, who the Jews confronted Jesus and said, well, when a man dies and, you know, then his brother marries, and they go, well, who's he going to be married to in heaven? And Jesus said, you're not going to be married to any of them in heaven and all the women said, Amen. And, uh, you know, they go, because you'll be married, you know, un unto the Lord here. But in Jewish culture, that was the way that you, you, you know, allowed a name to continue on. So there'd be a, another marriage there. And she's saying, you know, are you guys willing to wait until, you know, I have more sons? I mean, this, you know, this it ain't going to happen, you know. So she says, turn back, my daughters, go for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a household, or excuse me, a husband tonight, and should also bear sons, would you wait for them until they were full grown? It says, would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? She's like, don't, don't live in temptation. Don't live in this weight. Don't put your life on hold. All these things that go through our hearts and minds. She says, for it grieves me very much for your sakes. And here's, here's where Naomi gets it all wrong. And maybe you're getting it all wrong tonight, too. She says that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. What is she doing here? I mean, she's declaring that God is against her. And isn't that amazing that when things happen like that, we immediately turn against God? We, we think that, you know, God's behind it, that he must have done this. I mean, the death of her husband, her two sons, and she's attributing to God as being a direct judgment against her. And maybe you're here tonight, like I said, and you, you feel the same way. She's wrong 
in her assessment of God. And if you feel that way, as lovingly as I can say this to you, you're wrong in your assessment of God as well. Again, John 3.16, God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish. For he, Jesus did not, in verse 17, he said, didn't come into this world to judge the world, but that through him the world might be saved. His heart isn't against you. I can't explain why you've suffered the losses that you have. Nobody can. Only God can. And one day, one day it'll make sense but it might not make any sense until the day that you see him face to face. But understand this, not every trial, not every sickness that you and I suffer through is God's direct judgment in this world or in an individual life at that. Again, we live in a fallen world. I, I share this all the time. We, we're broken people. We live in a broken world. We live amongst other broken people. It's just, sadly, it's a part of life. Sickness is a part of the fall. Trials are part of the fall. It's because we live in a fallen world. If you make it all about you, man, I'll tell you, it will destroy your life. She doesn't get it right. Verse 14 goes on, it says, and they lifted up their voices and they wept again. Man, this is just getting, I mean, so much harder. I mean, you, you can imagine, I mean, well, I guess you can't unless you've been in that, that place. And it says, and they wept again. It says, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Try to picture this. And sadly, we never hear from Orpah again. You don't hear anything about her in Scripture. She turns back. There's bad counsel by Naomi. I mean, God bless her. For the grace of God go I. What would we do if we were in her situation? But we've got to admit that what she was giving her daughter-in-law was bad counsel. Never, ever, ever encourage someone to enter into idolatry. Never, ever, ever tell them to turn back to the old way of life. The key is what we tell people to do is hold on to Jesus. Press on to the upward call that's in Christ Jesus. And again, you know what Naomi did was she underestimated the love of Ruth. See, Ruth's name again means what? Friend. Oh, what a friend Ruth is. She underestimated her devotion to God. Now, I'm not going to go into this because I'm going to share this on Mother's Day, but there's a beautiful picture here, even in Naomi's failure with regard to her relationship with Ruth. And I'll save that for you. Now you have to come on Mother's Day. Um, but, but you know what it's about. It says, But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more so also. If anything but death parts you from me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now, it didn't mean she, you know, people go, well, <laughs> that was a, what she's saying in, in, in the Hebrew language is she's not, she just quit trying to debate with her, quit trying to argue with her. It wasn't like she cut her off. And we know that as you read the book as it uh, continues on. It says, Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? This is like, you know, not good, okay? She's been gone 10 years. And this has been 10 hard years. And when she returns, basically what they're saying is, is that Naomi? It doesn't look like her. Man, these 10 years, they've been hard. <laughs> I mean, you're not supposed to say that to a woman. You know, when a woman, you know, I always loved that, that Abe Lincoln, it was a Geico commercial or something where, you know, it has an Abe Lincoln in it and, and he's standing there and he's like, you know, like Abe Lincoln can't tell a lie. And his wife comes out and she's like, you know, does this dress make me look fat? And, he, and, and he's like, uh, oh, 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 and you just see him, you know, in this. It's like, you know, so they must have been talking with the men of the city here because they're going, is this Naomi? Because the women would be going, what? Oh, it's so good to see you. You look so good. They, might, they would have went to coffee and said it, but they wouldn't have said it out loud. But the men of the city, they're just going, oh, my gosh, what happened to you? I mean, 10 years, I mean, it's like, is this Naomi? I mean, but what would happen when you've lost your husband, you've lost two sons, you go, that's, that's hard. And stress, I mean, they say this about presidents, right? That for every four years in office, they age 10. 
And you go, and you think about why, because the stress that you live under. Pastors are second, you know. So you're not supposed to make the pastor's job difficult, you know. You only get so many stints in life, you know. Verse 20 goes on, it says, But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. So now what's her testimony? Man, she's getting it wrong. She goes, I went out, but here she is, I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home. And I'm going to skip this because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you, but you can determine it for yourself because I'm going to teach this on, on Mother's Day. She goes, but I went home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? She's blaming God. And I just want to encourage you tonight, when you're hurting, God is the last one to blame because we know the end of the story for her, don't we? We know that she's the great-grandmother of King David. We know that Jesus Christ was born through the line of Boaz, her husband. And you go, gosh, I mean, to think that God would allow her by his grace to be grafted into that. But she doesn't see God's working for her. And he, she doesn't see that God is working on her behalf. And you know what? Tonight, if you're hurting, it's very difficult. I understand that. It's very difficult to see that. But all I can do is, is tell you, hey, read this story again. Read the rest of the story. For the Christian, rem be reminded again tonight, the best is still yet to be. This isn't the end of the story. There is a day coming where he's going to wipe away every tear from our eye. Amen? And we will rejoice, I mean, like we have never rejoiced before. We will be free. I mean, you think of free at last, free at last, free at last. And it says, so Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And now they came uh, to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. And we'll, we'll get into this next week, but I want to just close with one passage of scripture you know that i always am reminded of in moments like this and you know it's romans 8 28 and I, I think it's a favorite for most of us when you think about this because it's so true of ruth's life and it's true of every one of our lives tonight if we'll only let it become true it says this romans 8 28 says and we know that all things work together for good to those who love god to those who are called according to his purpose because, and if you go on and read the first part of verse 29, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So know this, whatever you're going through tonight, God is allowing you to go through it because he's using it to conform you into the image of Jesus. Now you have to answer the question, is there still maybe just a little bit of work that he needs to do in you so that you look perfectly like Jesus? And if you say, no, I don't know how to help you in that. <laughs> I, need, I need a lot of work. So that I get that. And, and if you get that then too for you, you go, okay, Lord, but I know this. He'll never abandon you. He will never forsake you. He loves you so much more than you could even possibly know. And so I hope as we go through this, it just, it'll speak to you. you know,